Welcome back to Jake's Take with Jacob Elishar podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Elishar, the chief content producer and writer of jakestake.com, a pop culture entertainment news website. I am thrilled to welcome one of my favorite podcasters and also comic book commentators, Wes Daughtry from Thinking Critical, back to the podcast. So, Wes, welcome back. Well, thanks for having me back, Jake. I'm glad we could come back here and talk comic books. You know, this is what I live for. I'm glad to have I'm glad to have you back. Now, before we get started, guys, if you're watching this, please like it and subscribe to not only my channel, but also Thinking Critical as well. And also, if you're listening to this, make sure you leave us a five-star review and also leave a comment. Also, so Wes, it's been almost a year since we last spoke one-on-one. So how have you grown as a content creator since we last spoke? Well, I've grown a lot. You know, it's it's all trial and error, just you know, doing YouTube and, you know, kind of getting into podcasting games. So uh, I've gotten much better with my presentation. I've kind of changed the way that I'm uh, presenting information on my channel. I've actually gotten a lot better at it. So I'm able to produce essentially twice as much content. Whereas before I was doing about one video a day. Now I'm doing two, 2.5, somewhere in there videos a day. So uh, I've gotten much more uh, streamlined with the process. I think I've gotten better with the presentation and I think the results show. So I'm, I'm very happy with the growth that I had in the last year. Also, guys, just to let you know, Wes just hit, and Theme Critical Channel just hit a milestone, 10,000 YouTube subscribers. So congratulations, first of all. I'm so happy for you, Wes. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was a, it was a lot of work, and you know, YouTube's a real grind, so it was really nice to actually finally kind of hit one of those big numbers. Uh, obviously, we're hoping to hit bigger numbers in the future, but I, I'm very, very blessed and grateful to, to be where I am right now. You create incredible comments. Com- commentary and incredible videos. So I'm very happy for you, Wes. And I think, and I believe this is going to be a better breakout year for Thinking Critical. Well, I hope so. Yeah, I've uh, been working really hard. Definitely not going to, not going to keep pushing forward, trying to improve the content and, and see if we can grow the audience even more in uh, 2021. All right, so let's get started. Up first, DC Comics, the original guys, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. But however, we got to get to several big events. So basically, DC wrapped up a long story arc such as Batman, Three Jokers, The Doomsday Clock, and Death Metal. So in your humble opinion, how were these events, and do you think they were worth the hype? That's interesting. So the the one event that just wrapped up that I really liked was Deceased, but that's kind of its own little pocket universe of like a DC Comics zombie thing going on. I think um, I think people were probably disappointed just a tad bit in Batman Three Jokers because it had been built up for essentially five years. It was introduced in Justice League, Dark Side War, reintroduced in DC Rebirth, which was a huge, enormously successful relaunch of the DC Universe. Obviously, we also got Doomsday Clock, but we were supposed to get Batman Three Jokers in that as well. And I, I think people in their minds, they thought we were going to get this like transcendent story about Joker and what Joker is and how... You would have three three Jokers in the Batman universe, and that, you know how could that be? And uh, it was a really good story. It's easily the best illustrated comic I saw in in the entire year of 2020. But it was it was a Batman detective story that was very much about the um, the the pain and healing process that that Batman himself, Batgirl, Barbara Gordon, and Jason Todd Red Hood went through after their dealings with Joker along the time we saw. Three different Jokers, uh, three different ages of Jokers. And it, it it wasn't as big or as grand as people expected, so it was a little bit more smaller and contained. I think in 20 years, people are going to look back at that, and it's it's still going to be on shelves. It's still going to be in print, and uh, it's going to be something that's looked at a lot more fondly in time because it won't have the expectations. Uh, Dark Knight's Death Metal? I, it, it's tough because I, I think... I, I personally like Scott Snyder, who's who's easily the, the like the best selling writer at DC has been for quite some time since he took over Batman years ago when you know we introduced Court of Owls and all that stuff. Um, he's always he's got a tendency to keep going bigger and bigger. I think he's best when he's show he's doing like a smaller, more intimate kind of Batman story. But I think Death Metal might have gotten too big. Like he had so many concepts in there where you've got Perpetua and you have a, a group of like celestial beings that are coming to come back to earth and destroy it. But then you had the Batman who laughs, who's being powered up to a, like a godlike level to 
to do this and this, and you got to get the Morbius chair and the Trinity are having to go to three different crises to, you know, to capture all this energy to power up flash, but that, and um, I think in the end, it probably it kind of collapsed under its own weight. The art was spectacular from Greg Capullo. There were some very high moments, you know, the, um, the speed metal special, the Trinity crisis special. I think, you know, the ending is probably what they wanted. You know, it, it is, that is the launch of the new era of DC comics, the new DC omniverse. But I think the story as a whole, like when, if, when people try to read that in 10 years, they're going to be confused because there's agree. so many moving parts. There are so many moving parts. Like, I'm like, you had Josh Williamson in there. You had Jim C. in the fourth. You even had Jeff Johns with giving Superboy Prime a surprise redemption that no one saw coming. But yeah, that's probably another one of the big highlights. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially since he was billed as one of the biggest bads in DC for a long time. And then I wanted to circle back to Batman Three Jokers. I definitely thought that was, I agree with you on your art. It was spectacular. And also, I'm sorry to spoil you guys, but however, we did see the survival of the Joker's first wife and his son. So I am surprised and shocked that James Tinney IV or, or Peter Tomasi or Mariko, who's taking over the titles, has not grabbed on that. Because if I was a writer, I'm like, I've got to grab this. I think it's being saved for the Batman 3 Joker sequel, which we thought we were going to see in 2021. But with a lot of the things that are going on with DC, and I think we'll probably get to this here in a little bit, um, a lot of the key creators, Jeff Johns and Jason Fabok, who did uh, Batman 3 Jokers, or have moved on to other projects. So we're likely actually to see that sequel in 2022. And I will be beyond shot if that will not be the focal point of that sequel book. I agree completely. And then um, before we get started, I forgot to mention Doomsday Clock. So Doomsday Clock, obviously, that was um, that was interesting. That's such a really great story. That's one that will definitely stay in the test of time. That's Jeff Johns introducing the Watchmen universe into the DC universe. And when DC uh, Universe Rebirth, which was the, the brainchild of Jeff Johns to, to basically reintroduce a better DC universe where you didn't uh, have kind of broken versions of heroes. It was basically bringing forward the best version of all the heroes, you know, in, in one universe. And the big mystery surrounding all of that was, you know, what is Dr. Manhattan doing? Why is the, the, the classic Watchmen button being in there? Obviously, we had a Flash Batman crossover that kind of hinted on it with the button. Jeff Johns eventually got to the series with, with Gary Frank on art, probably the best illustrated comic book of 2019. And yeah. uh, although it, it that it ended up spanning two, two and a half years because the, the release schedule kept getting delayed, but there's a lot of things that got changed in that comic. But you could tell that um Saturn Girl was supposed to play a huge part in it, but along the way, when we while during the production cycle, Brian Michael Bennis had come over to DC Comics, he wanted to write Legion of Superheroes. Saturn Girl was gonna pay, play a key part in that, so she seemed to have been removed from that. Also, Wally West being kind of stuck, you know, in limbo because of Dr. Manhattan was clearly a key point of emphasis, a key element at the beginning of Doomsday Clock. That seems to have all been but kind of lost <clears throat> by the end of the series. But when you do get to the end, Jeff Johns essentially salvages what the series by it's essentially a love letter to Superman and how important he was to the DC universe. And he's how he's essentially the cornerstone. He's the focal point. He is the beginning of the DC universe, no matter where you start reading in continuity. And it was really well done. But unfortunately, at the exact same time, uh, Jeff Johns had removed himself as the chief creative officer at DC Comics. He took like a co-producing DC Comics gig where he was more focused on the films and television production, but he was still writing. Dan Didio... Uh, came back to the forefront as the chief creative officer at the time, and he wanted to go to a different direction. He, I guess, he didn't believe in DC Rebirth and and what Doomsday Clock was was doing, which is essentially what we got with um, with Dark Knight's Death Metal, but it's kind of a different version. I would say an inferior version, if I'm being completely honest. Uh, so it's a great story. It's just it's it's tragic that the promise and the potential of what the DC universe could be 
coming out of Doomsday Clock was never realized because by that point they had already decided that uh, Diana Prince Wonder Woman was the first ever superhero in the DC universe, even though it makes no sense. And they were kind of readjusting the timeline to to go along with the the Generation Five event, which, which was scrapped, but then rehashed to become Future State, which we're seeing now. So Doomsday Clock, beautiful story. Mm -hmm. it, it will stand on its own merit for the test of time, but such it's it's what might have been, you know. I know, and it's have the just, and I'm so sorry, no offense to Scott and to Jeff, both of them the best of the of our generation when it comes to writers, when it comes to writers that have like will have the same impact that Denny o, the late Denny O'Neill will have, or the or Marv Wolfman would have of those of that type of storytelling. But at the same time, I didn't need to see the Justice Society be reduced again. I think yeah. the Doomsday Clock. I was moved to see it the Gary Frank with the just Superman with the Legion of Superheroes on one side and the JSA on the other side. I was moved and I wasn't moved so much with Scott Snyder and with Sarge, Sergeant Rock with the JSA. Yeah, definitely, you know, cause um, the Doomsday Clock story is a bit more of an intimate tale. You know, like I said, it was a love letter to Batman. Death Metal was extremely large and bombastic and over the top and, you know, the craziest things you've ever seen in the world. Then you try to have this, this moment and at that point you're that that's not what you were expecting you're like okay uh, i saw the 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 jsa again but the book's over it just all right all right so we got to move on um over the past few months dc's parent company warner media has made headlines for cutting ties with leaders such as dan didio and bobby chase these moves have forced several of the company's high profile Creators, this is Jan Jurgens, Jeff Johns, Craig Capullo, Jason Fabok, Jock, Peter Jada Masi, Robert Vendetti, and Scott Snyder into leaving DC for independent projects or being ignored by the current management. So, how are fans and comic book inside news commentators have handled this news? Well, well, we'll see. We haven't really seen the full effects of it yet. And, you know, they all they haven't left DC permanently. I, you know, there's no way we're not going to see that Jeff Johns, Jason Fabok. Uh, Batman 3 Joker book at, at DC and in, in probably in 2022. We are going to get a Gary Frank, Jeff Johns, Batman Earth 1 Volume 3 at the end of this year. That's already, uh, you know, out there. Supposedly Robert Venditti has a dream project at DC, but he also is taking work over at Bad Idea. Um, so we shall see. You know, DC is cutting costs. Warner Media as a whole is cutting costs. They, they're streamlining the division. Obviously, AT&T acquired the company a few years ago. The pandemic certainly didn't help anything. A very unsuccessful launch of HBO Max certainly exacerbated everything. And they're, they're trying to streamline. They're, they're cutting costs. They're bringing, uh, they're bringing in a, a whole host of new writers and new artists that people aren't familiar with. We're seeing a lot of them in Future State that's going on right now. That's going to be kicking off Infinite Frontier in March. You know, it, we, we shall say there's some promising returns of some promising things that we're seeing in future state, but there's also a lot of things that aren't promising. Some of these new creators probably, um, you know, don't have the, the right voice or the idea for the character yet. We, we shall see. Some people take a little time to to um, really find their footing. We think about Chip Zdarsky over at Marvel Comics. If you go read his first volume of Peter, pa Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man, it's a joke. It's one of the worst Spider-Man comics you'll ever read. If you go hit the next volume and, until the end of the series at Spider-Man 310, it's almost perfect. You know, it, it took him six months to kind of get his, his voice and his feet, you know, you know, wet, you know, getting on in on Spider-Man. So some people are gonna take some time to get to get really rolling with the characters. Obviously, you know, James Tynan is still on Batman. They have uh Jorge Menez is still on Batman. That's your your premier title, that's a premier creative team. Mariko Tamaki. On Dark Detective, seems like she's she's going to be fine with with Detective Comics. Dan Mora's art there looks amazing for Batman, so we got, appears we got a pretty decent team there. Where the returns we're seeing on Superman not so promising. And me personally, I'm a I'm a big fan of Philip Kennedy Johnson. I think what he's doing with The Last God, as far as a fantasy comic at DC on DC Black Label, is amazing. But you know the the Superman titles in Future State have been lacking, and he's going to be the writer on Superman and Action Comics. We shall see. So I don't know what the reaction is going to be. It, it, it feels mixed right now. We know that comic stores did not order robust on Future State. There was not a lot of, um, I don't know, retailers 
weren't buying into the hype. They, they maybe they, they weren't trusting DC's direction as far as future state. I think that is going to roll over into Infinite Frontier. I, I think they're going to be disappointed with sales outside of Batman. I don't think they're going to see the, the huge increases that they saw with DC Rebirth or even the new 52 when that relaunched. Uh, it was a huge success for about six months. And I don't think they're going to see that this time. I think it's definitely going to be very interesting right now. I am looking at Future Slate, and I do have the new Batman and also Green Lantern and then Justice League as well. I'm just being very careful because of budgetary reasons to get those three. And I may go over Stewart's Side Squad for the fourth one. But at the same time, Infinite Frontier, I'm like, I'm looking at all the, I'm looking at some of the stuff going on. I'm like, I love DC and all, but when it comes to, the pandemic's been tough and so mm -hmm. i gotta pick and choose and i think i told you on your on your youtube channels the books i'm going to probably go to would be grant morrison's the green lantern finale and then the tom king's batman catwoman and that would probably be it because dc unfortunately with the infinite frontier i gotta see infinite frontier first that i'm not holding my breath i'm i'm more uh bullish personally about infinite frontier at least a few of the titles i think tom king has proven his chops on the deceased universe it's been very successful i think his nightwing is going to be great I, i'm actually quite quite excited for that one uh, i can't remember the exact name of the artist it might be eduardo pinsica i might be wrong on that one but it's a long time contributor to him I, i'm a huge dick grayson nightwing fan I'm, I'm excited for that new creative team he's also got a like a batman prestige comic coming out it's five-parter uh batman uh, the Dark Knight, it's got a great title. Batman Goes to Europe, I, th I think that'll be a success. Although, I don't know, do you, is that really Infinite Frontier since it's not an ongoing? But oh, I, I, think the, I think the Green Lantern title has promise. I enjoyed the Green Lantern in Future State, although it wasn't really a Green Lantern book. So, you know, I, there's some titles out there. Okay, the one to watch out for is Swamp Thing for Ram V and uh, Mike Perkins. Because that what that Swamp Thing Future State has been the best comic book yet, and they those are the same creative team moving forward. But the lot I of think, titles. Yeah, I think I'm going to take my chances with Bendis with Justice League because it's an interesting lineup, especially if you have Hippolyta and Black and Black Adam on the same team as Batman and Green Arrow. Yeah, it, it should be fun. You know, obviously, um, Wonder Woman's gone. We we saw that at the end of Dark Knight's Death Metal. She's ascended, and I don't know. They're they're getting all their mythology kind of mixed up. Why is uh, Wonder Woman, you know, a Greek goddess in in uh, Valhalla? Like a, <laughs> that's that's North mythology, but DC's mixing their mythology and stuff up right now. But Hippolyta obviously be a great um, addition to to Justice League. Brian Michael Bendis has not been a huge success on DC Comics so far, but hey. Everybody's got that one time when they kind of turn back the clock and they were as good as they ever were, you know? Yeah. All right. So April, because of Infinite Frontier, the publisher's releasing multiple Batman titles, multiple Absolutely. Batman titles, and not focusing on forgotten characters. Why do you think DC is doubling down with Bat the Batman family? And if you were part of Warner Media, which characters should have either gotten their own titles or miniseries? Well, I think that Warner Media is probably this could probably an edict from at and says, hey, you need to be more profitable. There's no way, there's no character that you're going to lean on in all of comics, not just DC. Marvel doesn't have a Batman. Spider-Man cannot hold like eight titles like Batman can for DC Comics. So they're going all in on the Dark Knight. We've got a big Batman movie coming out for Robert Pattinson. I'm sure that uh, keeps Batman even more in the focus. We are seeing the, the, the Batman character showing up i believe in the batwoman cw series as well we're getting a spinoff from that batman movie i think it's called gotham pd so we're getting a tv show out of that so batman is the brain for dc comics and and whether that be films streaming you know cdw airverse that's he's the most prominent character yes we are getting a lot of batman we are getting batman we're getting detective comics obviously the two series we've had for so long a batman uh, black and white anthology series a black batman urban legends anthology series which Chip Zdarsky is writing the main story on that. I think it's going to be for at least six issues of that one. It's going to be with Jason Todd. So that's that one's really exciting, actually. What else are we get? Batman, um, The Dark Knight, Batman, Scooby Doo Mysteries. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, Batman, uh, Second Son, 
Bat, the next Batman Second Son, so the, the, that Batman. So, yes, we are getting a lot, Batman. I'm sure that I've missed a couple. Obviously, they, Batman. They have, we have the Robin title. title back, but it's now under Damien's control. We have Tom yeah. Taylor with Nightwing. We have the, I don't know what's going on with Batgirl. I still wish they had Gail Simone with Barbara Gordon. But, like, at the same time, it's Batman. It, I'm a Batman fanatic. I've been a bat, lifelong Batman fan. But that is just too much Dark Knight for me. It's, um, you know, because they've trimmed the line down significantly. It's not like, um, it, it feels like, it's probably not at half anymore. It feels like they're probably at like 60 or 70% of what they were before the pandemic as far as their plan release schedule. And it, it, it was like 20, 25% of all titles are Batman or Batman related. You know, that, you know, Justice League obviously is going to have a big Batman presence and stuff. And I, I guarantee you we're going to have more Batman. So uh, is it too much Batman? I, I would say so. There's some other characters out there. You know, we, we just had a fantastic run on Hawkman. Normally, he doesn't get a back-to-back -back run. So if we see Hawkman again, it'll be in a, like a JSA. But you know, there's a lot of tricky characters. We haven't heard anything about Jason Todd Red Hood. Uh, Tim Drake, another Batman-associated character. Uh, forever, you know, just kind of an afterthought. Where is where is that character? Why isn't he a bigger presence? That's, so, yeah, um, that's and we have the Green Lantern time titles being like down to one title, which, and then we still haven't heard about we still haven't heard about JSA, and you and, and I remember you coming on the last the podcast last time, and you said that Robert Vendetti and JSA maybe though that's the connection. We're hoping that's the hope. We have to get a JSA series, right? They've yeah, been it's been easy, far too long. Easy rebirth. They reintroduced it in uh, in Doomsday Clock. If you're reading Hawkman, the JSA were in there. And then when we saw Dark Knight's Death Metal was the the JSA emerged again. And the JSA, I believe, is going to be in the Black Adam movie. And that's one of the things. If you want to know, if you want to know what characters DC Comics are going to be promoting and pu publishing stories about, go look at the, the, the production schedules for HBO Max, for the CW Arrowverse, and the movies. That's what you're going to get in your comic books because they're, they're going for synergy across the line. So uh, the JSA is going to be... Is going to be out there, and so I'm expecting the series. If if it's not Reverend Venditti, I'll, I'll be disappointed. But you know, hopefully, it's Peter J. Tomasi or Dave Jurgens. I guess I agree. We need to have those voices who are the masters of DC, of the DC, the veterans. Absolutely. You know, it's um, it's probably I don't want to, they might take it disrespectfully. It's like comfort food. It's, that's what you go there for. You go there for your Robert Venditti, your Peter J. Tomasi, your, your Dan Jurgens. Dan Abnett, you know, uh, when he's working in the fold, Joshua Williamson, these established creators that you know have the right voice, not only just for the characters, but the DC universe as a whole. The DC universe, what separates from Marvel is it's an exceptionally hopeful superhero universe. Yes, a lot of the superheroes have godlike powers, and they might not be the hero outside your window, but that's not what the, the that's not what separates the DC universe from other uh, superhero comic universes. And if you don't go out there and embrace what makes DC special, what has made DC great for so many years, that's where you get a lot of the fan backlash and you, you get a lot of, um, you get a lot of readers being turned off. It's like this, you know, I, I don't come to DC for these deconstructed, terrible takes on wonderful characters like Superman. Yes, obviously you're going to get that with Batman and some of those more street level characters. But I, I think, uh, you, you know, that's why you need your Robert Venditti. That's why you need your, your Peter H. Moss, your Dan Jurgens. Your Williamson because they understand the universe and they get it right every time. Same with Jeff Johns, but I don't think we'll be seeing him as much. Yeah. Um. Speaking of, you talked about the House of Ideas, so we're going. To, we got to go there. So, we over the past few years, Marvel fans have been through constant company-wide events such as Secret Empire, War of the Realms, Empire, and then King of Black. So, why has Marvel been leaned towards this event model? And do you think fans are getting exhausted? Event fatigue is definitely real. Um, the reason that they go with this event model is it's the only thing I think that they get consistent sales with. Yes, there are titles like Amazing Spider-Man that no matter what, they're, they're going to do pretty well. And uh, a writer like Donny Cates, whether he's on Venom or Thor or uh, a Thanos miniseries, he's going to be able to move some titles. But they don't have a lot of guarantee movers out there. Even your Avengers series right now, the series, the the sales aren't very good right now. The writing just hasn't been very good. Although we are getting an event spinning out of Avengers, you know, in uh, in May of 2021, 
called Heroes Reborn, basically a rehash of an event from 25 years ago. Shocking. The House of Ideas, re recycling old ideas is, is kind of what they do now. We're getting Clone Saga and Miles Morales, another disappointing event uh, they're kind of working with. So I think they have to go with these events because it's, it's something that will garner interest. They'll actually be able to get some sales because even if people are turned off by the event, they'll normally come in and, and peak just to see if it's good. But the main thing about it really is the amount of number one issues that they get. And when you have number one issues, you get speculators. And that is what drives their sales. And when you have a number one issue, you can you can open up the coffers a little bit, maybe go do 40 or 50 variant covers and really spike a number on that that number one. You know, you look at what they do with, with King and Black, you're how many tie-ins are there that that comic book now like 50 i lost Got to be something like that <laughs> you know the main series is only five issues and you know they're they're um you know organic tie-ins like venom and stuff like that but you know we're we're getting tie-ins to sword and they rebooted the black cat series to a number one for that one and we're getting you know marauders it it gets a bit ridiculous and but it's definitely not stopping it's it's only the cycle is only getting faster. I, you know, um, I think every year you just get more events. And you know, they're probably going to come in a shorter amount of time because retailers don't have a, enough time to gauge the audience. Interest, you know, they might have to order the entire event before issue number one arrives nowadays when you do this uh, release like they did for Empire and some of their other events in 2020. And uh, it puts the retailers in a real bind. Because they just don't they don't know what the interest is going to be. You know by issue number two if it's a hit or not. But for a retailer, if you already ordered the next three issues or maybe the next four issues of the series, you're kind of, you know, SOL. Or maybe it's a huge hit and you underordered and you need more. Then you're kind of screwed because uh, you don't you don't have the inventory for your customers. But I, I think they like keeping keeping retailers on their toes. So they they just have to kind of order in the dark. All righty, so we, I know you brought the events, so we're going to go to right to it. So Marvel has released details of the upcoming Jason Aaron and Ed McGinnis's Heroes Reborn event. Details have included World Without Avengers. You have vis villains such as Dr. Juggernaut, which is basically Dr. Doom and Juggernaut, and Silver Witch, which is Enchantress and Scarlet Witch. You have Squadron Suprema as the leaders. Peter Parker is doing his best to meal some impression. And then you have Philip Colton running for political office. So it will be Marvel's Heroes Reborn will be the first event in 2021. It will be dropping in May. Do you think they're leading up as a flashpoint for these? This is Marvel's flashpoint. You know, I don't. Marvel doesn't really do crisis style reboots like DC does. But they did call it, I think originally it was going to be called avengers rebirth and then i think they realized that was a name that was so closely tied to dc comics you know with your green lantern rebirth flash rebirth dc universe rebirth and everything had a rebirth title i think they've rebranded it recently or maybe we are still getting an avengers rebirth later in the year maybe we're getting heroes reborn and avengers rebirth i don't think it's a it's not going to be permanent there's no way because this is going to be i don't know it's kind of like what is it um Age of Apocalypse, where all yeah. of a sudden everyone wakes up. You're in a different future where everything has changed, but only one character remembers what it is. I believe in that one it was was a bishop. Now yeah. it's going to be Blade remembers everything that everyone has forgotten, and he's got to set the universe right again. So it feels almost like um, they're doing a 25th anniversary tribute to Heroes Reborn and Age of Apocalypse, which is interesting because that one's also 25 years old. They did something similar on a smaller scale with – uh, Marvel Knights like a couple years ago with Donny Case that didn't turn out very well either. So I think they're just um, this. It's not a permanent status quo change. Blade's going to save just, the day, and we'll get back to the universe we all know and love. All right. So speaking of the universe that we all know and love, I've been watching your videos, and you've been you have not minced words about Jonathan Hitmaker's relaunch of the X Men. So, and as we're entering year two of X of John Hickman's X Men, so you what? Why do you think that Hickman's plans for Marvel's Mary Mutants are not good for the franchise as a whole? I think Jonathan Hickman's plans were amazing for, for X-Men. If you read House of X Powers of 10, when he relaunched the franchise, one of the best comic stories the last five years, if not the best comic story the last five years. I think that um, he's been meddled with. 
uh, Jordan White and the other, you know, he's the, the like the group editor for X Men. Uh, I think he's gotten in there. In I don't know. I, I, I it doesn't feel like a Hickman's X Men anymore. It feels like it's been hijacked by all the other voices. And um, you know, we just came out of Ten of Swords. That was weird. You can see you've got um, Jonathan Hickman's story that he introduced in ha uh, House of X Powers of Ten, where you have uh, originally I think it was Araco. It, it was separated. Uh, Okara went in, into the breach, and and all these mutants were sealed in there. But uh, Apocalypse, not Apocalypse, um, yeah, Apocalypse was left behind on on Krakoa, and then finally you're you're having this conflict where they're they're going to reunite the, the 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 islands, and the other mutants are going to come back, and it's you know it's a the original Four Horsemen and Apocalypse's original family. So that's all the stuff that Jonathan Hickman set up, but then they like mashed it up with this weird Camelot like story that T.D. Howard was building in Excalibur where he had Saturnine and all this magical games and it was supposed to be a contest of champions where everyone had to get a sword and then it turned out they weren't sword fighting they were map questing and they were having dance offs and one of the heroes was going to have sex with a rock and they were going to murder a kitten and it was so totally different and to to put the two events into one event it, it, it's a real like it's competing narratives so people that were excited for what jonathan hickman was was doing when you get to all that other stuff that's happening over in other world with the magic it's a complete turn off and then the people that are enjoying all the magic stuff that's happening in other world they get to all the serious stuff with with the mutant confrontation and the the uh, armies of Ameth and the hordes and all that stuff. They want to go back. To, it, it it just didn't mesh well. You know, you got the ten percent in the middle that liked both of it, and it probably was great for them. But I don't know. It's just watered down. Dawn of X has it, it had too many titles. We're into Reign of X now. We've already got the Sword title. We got Way of X. You know how many new X Men titles? We got Children of the Atom coming this year. I believe um, X Corpse is coming this year. I mean, I bet we get six more X Men titles this year. It's how many X-Men titles can you really have? The the series, the franchise just launched, like relaunched like 15 months ago. It's ridiculous. I agree with you on this because the thing is we have a lot of, like I'm just paying attention to the regular X-Book and Marauders. Like those are the two key components of the Marvel, of the X-Book. Because John Hickman on X-Men, the regular X-Book, I've been and pleased by it. I think that the election is going to be an interesting storyline coming up. Sad that Jean Grey is not on the Quiet Council anymore because now you have people like Sebastian Shaw and Exodus and Sinister on there and the seat running around. So, yeah, they're supposed to be the, uh, I don't know, I guess the the even out all the villains on the on the council. You had like the, uh, what were they, the summer, the summer panel where it was. Yeah, uh, you, had Jean, they had, you had Jean, Storm, and Nightcrawler. Yeah, so. They're going to have an election to, to fill that seat, but they're also going to have an election for the new X-Men team, which I imagine Jean Grey is going to be a part of. Uh, we'll, we'll see where that goes. There are titles I'm absolutely enjoying. I think Ben Percy has fit into the X-Men universe uh, like a glove. He's doing pretty darn well on X-Force, although it lost a little bit of steam. But the work he's done on Wolverine has been great. If you like Wolverine, it's, it's been a really fun title. The art there has been spectacular. But the, the series that's really blown my mind that I will – had no expectations for was is um is Hellions. Zeb Wells, I, I was like, okay, it's I read the first issue, I was like, okay, it's mutant suicide squad. You know, they, they send them in there to die. And of course, with the new X-Men universe, everybody can be um basically reincarnated. So yeah, do you have stakes? But you know, when I got into Hellions and with this artist Steven Segovia, it turns out it's a really good fun team book. It's one of the few X-Men books that feels like an X-Men book right now. And I think that's probably the issue with the entire line. Most of it doesn't feel like X-Men. I agree. So let's wrap up the Marvel. We got to talk about where Donny Cates is going to be laying next because Donny Cates announced that he'll be stepping down from Venom after the King of Black is over. So in your humble opinion, how has Donny Cates grown Venom as a franchise? And where do you think Marvel is going to place Donny next? Well, Donny Case has, has done a lot with Venom, you know, in short order, too. You know, he's changed a, a lot of the lore of Venom. You know, originally Dylan Brock was Eddie's brother. You know, uh, 
Eddie lost his sister tragically in an accident. That was a, a big part of his character. And we found out that the Venom symbiote was kind of altering Eddie Brock's memory. So Dylan Brock was actually his son. His sister never existed. Uh, you know, so the, the suit was trying to make Eddie codependent. So they, they kind of dealt with that. But along the way, they also introduced Noel, the symbiote god in issue number three. We started seeing these Grendel, like symbiote dragons flying around. And um, he really kind of blew it up. And you know, just thinking about Venom is is one of the best selling ongoing titles in in all of comic books not you know it's it's the perennial bestseller at marvel right now and so you got to give donny cates and ryan stegman and ivan coelho uh you know the other artist that works on venom when when stegman's kind of working on the event books uh, a lot of credit because you know what are they um in the 30s right now close to issue no yeah they're on issue like number 32 right now and it's still bestseller that doesn't happen all that often in the industry. You know, a lot of times you, the sales tail off pretty dramatically, and he's kind of risen them. So Donny Cates done a really good job. They got two enormous events out of this. Think about it. In in a two year time frame, they they got Absolute Carnage last year, which is essentially was the prelude to King of Black, which we've got now. They've both been bestsellers. Marvel made a ton of money putting Donny Cates on Venom. Now is he leaving Venom? Well, he says he's never writing Venom again. But I, you know, I. I I, I'm starting to believe the the hype that people are saying that he's playing, he's working the audience, and that maybe it's not going to be Venom anymore. It's going to be King Venom or a new name for the title moving forward. I'm hoping, my my hope is that um, it feels like he's done a lot of work on the title. You know, to, is he going to be writing Venom for five years? It doesn't feel like a Donny Cates thing to do. I'm hoping he moves over to Avengers. It feels like Jason Aaron Aaron's time should be about wrapping up. Obviously, he has the Heroes Are Born. Um, story arc or the event that's coming up, you know, it, it's it's a flat series right now. Avengers should be one of the 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 cornerstones. It should be one of the tent poles for Marvel Comics, and it's not right now. It's not a hot title. It's it's been pretty bad for a while, and um, I think they need a big big creator on that series. And then nobody's going to put more spotlight on that series that's at Marvel right now than Donny Cates. So I'm hoping that he's the new writer on Avengers. But I think he's just going to be the new. He's going to be the writer on, like King Venom, or some new I, title. I think it's Donny Cates is definitely done the scary symbiote rights. I think there's a lot. There's not a lot of creators that have gotten Venom very well, but he has. So I think he would be great. But I also do agree with you that Jason Aaron's arc is running. I think it's getting close to re wrapping up, and I think if like if Marvel has done a lot of like if you look at all the people that he they had bet over the past. 11 years, you had Bendis on the title. You had Hickman on the title. You have Aaron on their title. Basically, the top writers in Marvel were each had their turn on Avengers. And I think you're right. Donnie Gates could be could be the heir apparent to Avengers. Well, yeah, if they want a big Avengers event that's going to sell a lot of titles, Heroes of Born doesn't feel like that's going to be a bit be it. Donnie Gates is the guy. He if he goes on a series. He launches an event out of it. It feels like a big deal, and people show up for the ride, especially because he brings Ryan Stegman likely with him on, as the artist. And, uh, you know, is he the best artist at Marvel Comics? Probably. Maybe. He's up there. I like Marco Cicchetto probably on Daredevil better, but, it, you know, apples and oranges at that point. You know, he's a premier artist in the industry. So, it, And that's probably one of the things that you really get with Donny Cates nowadays is, you know, he, I, I'm certain that he has a he has a, a line of people that of artists that just want to work with it, and he can probably just has his pick of the litter of, of premier artists. So that's something that he also brings to the table as far as um, moving to one of those premier characters. He's going to be be able to bring any number of premier artists with him, which is a big deal right now. There aren't that many of them. Awesome. So we got to start wrapping things up. So why should the audience check out Thinking Critical? You know what? If you love comic books. And if you like somebody that is a little bit hot-headed from time to time, but for the most part has, has a pretty composed take on the industry, I'm not a shill. I'm not going to sit there and blow smoke up your butt and tell you everything is, is great when it's not. I'm also not betting against the industry. I don't want everything to collapse, but I am going to tell you when I think things are wrong. So if you want uh, someone that's a straight shooter that's going to tell you what, when things are good, tell you when they're bad, point out a couple comic books that maybe you didn't even know existed that are really good right now, Come over to Thinking Critical and, and have a good time. I have a wonderful uh, slate of guests that come on from time to time. Obviously, Collins by Perch being the, the most prominent one. We 
we do a lot of collaborations, but I, I have a lot of pros throughout the industry. I've got other YouTubers. I've also got retailers, so I get a, a retailer perspective. And I have lifelong uh, comic fans that come on and, and we discuss, you know, breaking news. We discuss, you know, long-standing issues in the industry. We just discuss geek culture and we like to have fun. And if you like, uh, you know, a nice two-hour stream every Saturday, you'll get that, uh, you know, with the comics aficionados where we, we do a panel and we just talk about everything. And, you know, it's it's very interactive and we have a lot of fun. So if you love comic books, there's there's no better place to go than, than Think of Critical YouTube, in my opinion. I agree completely, guys. So also, Wes, where can they connect with you? Not just on YouTube, but also social media and, I, and other stuff as well. Uh, well, the main place is going to be on Twitter. I'm at, at Wes underscore from underscore TC. I do have a Discord server, but I'm on. I'm not on it that as much as I would like to be. I do have two little bitty kids right now, uh, about to have a third one. We're we're very excited that the family is growing uh, in 2021. So I don't have as much free time as I would like, but that that's going to be the best place. I also have a an email if you if you want to get get in contact with me, maybe come on the channel or, or pass some information. Wes Diggs Comics at gmail.com. You can get a hold of me. Congratulations, Wes. I'm so happy for you and your family. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we're uh, we're very excited. It should be a, a summer baby, so. Awesome. So, guys, to download more episodes of the Jake's Take with Jacob Ellie Share podcast, head to Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Spreaker. Jake's right Take with Jacob Ellie Share podcast. J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Now, are you on social media? Because I'm on social media, too. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, all Jacob Elyshar, J-A-C-O-B-E-L-Y-A-C-H-A-R. Now, just get this. This Jake's take, Jake's .com is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. 10 years. The head to the website that started it all. Thank Absolutely. you so much, Wes. For Congratulations on 10 years, brother. I'm, I'm uh... So, so proud of you. It's, it's hard to, to make a name and, and to keep doing all this stuff. It's a lot of work and it, it's paying off. And uh, congratulations. It's well thank earned. You so, thank you so much. And guys, you can check out our original 2019 podcast on Jake's Take. Well, no, 2020. Why did that? Oh, it's been a long year. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Anyway, Wes, I always enjoy talking and having your insights on comic books, and I'm very excited to see what's going on. Congratulations with your family. Congratulations with Thinking Critical. This will be a big year for you, my friend. Thank you very much, and you too, brother. All right. Thank you, guys, and thank you so much for watching, and thank you so much for listening. Bye.